Hi friends, this is John, and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we talk about the agronomic science and cultural management practices that regenerate plant health, soil health, and public health. My guest for this episode is Lauren Steinlogge, who I had the privilege of meeting last winter at a conference. Lauren was kind enough to host us at his farm for our first two-day course earlier this week. I had the privilege of getting to meet him and his family, spend some time on their farm, and learn more about some of the work they're doing to rapidly regenerate and rebuild soil health and sequester a lot of carbon and grow some really healthy crops. Lauren, I'm really happy to have you here in the podcast. You've had an interesting story, personal journey with your own family and health challenges that has then led you to begin farming very differently and adopt some practices that were not at all being considered in mainstream agriculture at that moment in time. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and story and what brought you to some of the things that you're working on today? Lauren, what is the history of relay cropping on your farm? When did you first begin adopting it and how did that come about? Thank you for having us, first of all. Our our history has just been kind of one of evolution, I would always call it. You know, we early in the game, me and my wife always said it seemed about every time we get to the point where we thought we had things figured out, we'd have to re-engineer ourselves, just redefine what we're doing. And, you know, that goes all the way back to short history is I was, uh, when I was 14, I was hit broadside by a semi. And over the years, scar tissue led me to the point where I can't be around livestock because I can actually pick up livestock disease and stuff like that. So growing up thinking I was going to be a uh, livestock farmer kind of was thrown out the window pretty quick. And I had the realization that I had to try to make it grain farming. In our area, the land rent, and that's pretty competitive. So we always had to figure out our little niche to try to make things work better. You know, about the time we thought we had that figured out, picked up a lot of custom work. At one point, we were probably doing 1,500 acres of our own work and another 1,000 acres of custom work through the custom planning, custom harvesting, crop care, all that stuff. At one point, I'd probably say I was confirmed workaholic. And then uh, 2008, my wife convinced me to finally take a vacation. I've never truly wanted to work since. I just At that point, I learned I had to work smarter you know, a fresh mind is way more competitive than a tax help mind, which was fortunate because uh, six months later, my son Rollin was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And suddenly we had to figure out how the farm was going to run with her without me because the high priority was focused on our son. Through that period, we kind of learned what it was what it was like, you know, what people were really like when you were in your worst of times, you know, we started losing land just for the simple fact landlords didn't want us to be overworked, which is a little scary because I never really thought I left off, you know, I never backed off doing what we were doing. And, you know, we tried to persevere, but uh, we just had to get lean and mean and survival mode continued, I guess is the way I always refer to it. And currently now our farm Strictly a row crop grain farm, but uh, we do corn, beans, wheat, rye, barley, buckwheat. Got sunflowers this year, had some oats too. But then, you know, as history would show, Mother Nature tends to throw us curveballs this year. Some of the relay cropping and that, we've had to uh, pull the plug on a lot of that. Uh, even the interseeding, you know, we had to pull the plug on that. Just Mother Nature's the got bats last, as a lot of people like to say. So this year you're not doing any relay cropping, but in the prior years when you have been, what has your relay cropping been looking like? What crops are you relaying with each other? What does your overall relay rotation look like, if it can be called that? It was kind of part of the evolution from, uh, we started interseeding 06, I believe it was. In 2012, the whole farm was strong corn on corn back in them days. So interseeding was kind of my way into cover crops. We started through some of the people the guy was meeting and stuff like that. I was introduced to a guy named John Coots, and then another guy out in Nebraska that I was uh, focused on was Shane Graving out there, and just started 
open a line of communication with them. You know, we had the equipment to intercede. Well, it's the same equipment we needed to set up for the relay crossing and that. John up there, Fort Atkins, Wisconsin, has been at it. I'm going to guess he's pushing 15 years now that he's been doing it. You know, started looking at his system and quickly decided, you know, that was the guy I was truly going to follow. Ended up even borrowing his uh, original blocker guards. Started seeing what was happening there in our undulating terrain. Having steel out in front of the cutter bar was not a good option for me, so I quickly converted over to plastic pushers that we just made with uh, drainage tile. Then I uh, converted over to bolt type, bolt on type blocker guard. But even that was limited because you start realizing we can't push the soybeans down. Now, as of last year, we brought in the row crop head and was planning on running that this year. But as I said earlier, Mother Nature kind of made sure we didn't have relay cropping this year because uh, May 15th, all our cereals were froze brown and laying flat on the ground. Biggest thing with relay cropping is it builds options into what we're doing, I guess. That's what I like to reinforce to people. You mentioned just now that you're growing the rye for seed. And in our conversation the last couple of days, you described that the way relay cropping is sometimes done, it doesn't produce a high enough quality crop to be produced for seed because it doesn't have enough uniform germination and so forth. What are the important characteristics in your mind to make sure that relay cropping does produce the same type of crop quality that just straight cropping might? The simplest setup is, you know, every fall, all our acres has twin row cereals, either winter wheat or rye. If we don't get the acres covered, then we'll consider like a spring malt barley or even the spring oats. We've relayed uh, soybeans into all of them now. As winter unfolds, then we'll start monitoring stands, stuff like that. If it's not a good stand, we'll just roll that right over into corn. If the stand's good enough, then we'll go in and install the soybeans pretty much at a normal time. I've used the same drill to put the beans in, but that's evolved now. We're just using a 30-inch planter to put the beans in because it gives us more room to for the combine and stuff like that. In the spring there, we'll monitor, see what the you know if there's any herbicide needed. Usually with cereal rye, generally I like to cereal rye just because it's simple and you know we have a very good market for cereal rye around here with the cover crops. You know, we'll come in and install the soybean. About July, usually about this week, is when we'll be starting to harvest. If we have winter wheat, that usually goes first. Cereal rye will go the following week. Malt barley will go about another week or two. Then if weather dependent, if we get a window, then we'll slip buckwheat in there. But that window is about July 15th to 20th for me. And then we'll harvest the buckwheat and the soybeans together if we get that window. When you think about producing uniform germination, obviously you need uniform seed maturity. How does relay cropping sometimes fail to deliver that? Well, to, to pay the bills here, I, we've from day one, we decided we had to focus on uh, seed quality, food grade quality. And every guy that's hardcore on something like that you know the first thing they start telling me is you know the uniform emergence is critical and then that plays all the way through harvest if you watch your heads as you're coming to harvest you want them all to mature about the same time and then we we will actually push harvest and try to catch the cereal as it dries down we will try to catch it on the way down to harvest it because from what everybody has showed me and told me from the testing we've seen, once that cereal crop dries and re-wets, you start losing your quality and germination. So that's why we, seeding rate-wise and that, we tend to push the limit. I mean, I'd much rather sell a, you know, our malt barley there for a couple of years. We were 7 or $8 a bushel if we could make the cut. If we run everything through the seed side, food-grade wheat is usually 2 $3 premium. If we run it through the grain cleaners and stuff like that, we can push up to uh, almost double the value or 8 to $10. We can sell winter wheat on the seed side or cereal rye, you know, $10 usually is a minimum. We've had as high as 18 to $20 cereal rye seed. Just now you mentioned controlled traffic, and I know you were an early adopter of using CTF on your farm and have seen some quite remarkable 
results with it. What led to your adoption of controlled traffic and, and what's the story behind that? Actually, we've been finding it easier with our setup. If I can help it, we will not drive on the crop or anything, you know, with our controlled traffic and that we can we can just set up and with the guidance and that we're running very little damage to any cereal crop installing the beans even if we have to put a herbicide on we just run the tram lines some of that really became evident when we started playing with the malt barley uh malt barley guys you know their goal is to have all the seed germinate within hours i don't know all the details you know i just know what they're telling me and you know for a fledgling malt barley company to win quality awards off the first batch i thought that was pretty cool so you know it showed we did our research and paid attention. What results have you observed from controlled traffic? You've now been doing it on all your fields for at least 11 years and some of them almost two decades. So what have the effects and what have the improvements been? Controlled traffic, it was just kind of natural fit for us, the way our field layout is and stuff like that. It just was part of the mindset early in the game. You know, I didn't know there was such a thing as controlled traffic when we started going down the path, but it just had the mindset if we don't create compaction, we shouldn't have to spend any money to alleviate compaction. You know, there's a lot of guys out there spending a lot of money trying to solve compaction issues, and it's as simple as don't create it in the first place. And, you know, the CTF gives us that option. We never went out of our way to get there, but, you know, matching up the implements as we traded was the simple option. You know, the combine jumping a 12-row head was the final key to the puzzle most of our fields have been on the same tram line since at least 09 some as far back as 02 i would have to say we were we were very early in the game on the parallel tracking for john deere i mean actually the first first wiring harness we had in a tractor through john deere was had a hand part numbered serial number on it how have your water infiltration rates shifted over time I would say a lot of it comes back to just a simple observation and feel of the soil. It just flows different. It acts different. You know, our fields are smooth. You know, when we do custom work, you can just tell the difference. Now, for the more professional-minded, you know, we've got data going all the way back as we watched infiltration and stuff like that. But the biggest thing I usually watch is aerial imagery. I like to, well, before drones and that were popular, you know, we'd, we'd get up in the air in a helicopter or something and fly the fields and just kind of look and see what you see out there in the fields. You know, the eyeball can tell you quite a bit what's going on out there. The biggest reason I like the aerial is you get the whole picture, not just a snapshot in time. You know, fast forward to where we're at now. Now we have uh, soil probes and stuff like that telling us the, the moisture levels in the soil all the time and temperature and if you watch where we're at, you know, it's really been fun this summer. I watched all the rainfall events, and within, I think it's like three, four hours, we have, so, you know, a half inch of rain. We can have moisture 30 inches deep. We've done a lot of them, and I, I like watching them. But like I said, I, I don't even care to take the time to do them. You know, we've got the eight second inch, uh, inch and eight seconds. We've seen a lot of that, you know, go right next into the tram line. And uh, it's three to four times easily, I would say. 2012 is some of the first time we did some of the infiltrations, and I, I have the data on that. The neat part in 2012 when the NRCS came out to do the first ones of them, our tram lines were better than uh, most you know, neighbors' fields. What do you attribute that to? Just the consistency of the soil. You know, we were doing earthworm, you know, they, they did the full soil health spectrum, what it was, what was uh, considered uh, norm in 2012. The one I remember most is they did like the Drager tube test, which was kind of the precursor to uh, Solita. Nobody that even took the test could kind of decipher what it was telling us. You know, and that led me to meeting Dr. Joe Clapperton over the years. And then she kind of helped understand what we were seeing on some of that. The scary part is some of that data is getting so, you know, eight, 10 years old already on some of that stuff. We can duplicate the test all the time, but, you know, the evolution of the ship tell me we've got the access to technology and the sensors now. You know, I can go out and pound a ring, but that doesn't tell me, doesn't tell me as the weather pattern changes, how quickly things can change. And a hand test is so subjective, it's a little scary. 
you know, the guy running the test can actually influence the outcome pretty easily. You mentioned your water infiltration rate right beside the tram lines being an absorption of an inch of rainfall in eight seconds and being three to four times higher than that away from the tram lines, if I understood correctly. Well, that, the tram line is you know lower infiltration than the, the rest of the field. How has with these infiltration rates and moving water down deeply, moving half an inch of rainfall 30 inches deep, how has your soil's water holding capacity changed over time? Do you have more water storage capacity today? Yes. Uh, the first time we saw my rain, my soil on the rainfall simulator, the easiest observation I noticed was uh, that our soils held a third of the moisture compared to the ideal setup or the worst setup. If you're familiar with the rainfall simulator, you, you know you want it to end up in the back jug, not the front jug. Well, every time they'd run it, they'd see you know, either the back jug would be full or the front jug would be full where ours would only, you know, there was only two thirds of the moisture in the jug completely. Well, I told you that little story about that time and I forgot to finish it off because, you know, the guy, uh, when he ran the test, the first time I seen the test, he's like, Warren, I apologize. We didn't set it up right. The the pan actually flipped and broke in pieces that first test because, you know, I, I was ashamed when I seen the first time because, you know, a third of the moisture ended up in the front jug, a third ended up in the back jug. Then when he followed through and told me that he flipped the pan and it actually broke in half and it was almost like tilled dirt, well, that explained why we ended up with so much moisture in the front jug. But every time we've seen my soil on the rainfall simulator since then, we've actually duplicated that every time. And then fast forward to now, you know, a couple of years ago, the RCD office that we work quite a lot with, we were part of a tile line monitoring program and they monitored 40 outlets in our county everybody's tile lines ran all summer except for ours only four times that summer our tile lines ran and all four times were after a four in, or a two inch rainfall event so your soils are holding and absorbing so much water that it's not even reaching the tile line correct that's exactly what we're looking for Actually, I'd like to hear from you also the story of the soil pit that you dug for Dr. Jill Clapperton. Uh, I was there on your farm just a couple days ago, and I see this depression in the soil that's approaching a foot deep, at least 10 inches deep, and several feet in diameter. What's the history of that, and how did that come to be? Uh, I believe it was 2016 when Dr. Jill Clapperton was here, and we actually moved the field day that we'd been working on for a couple of years to our farm just to give us the latitude to do stuff like the root pit and showcase what we're doing. We dug that root pit, backfilled it, all the soil went back in the pit. That following spring, the first thing I noticed was we had a depression there. Every year since then, we still have that. You know, if you look closely, you can see the outline of the root pit. I'm bullheaded enough. I want to see how many years it takes for that soil to heal. And the only explanation I can figure is we've built that much air and infill, you know, air into our soils due to lack of compaction and stuff like that. You can see it the other day there when we pop the shovel full of soil out of there versus it's just tillage induces air, but it also collapses once it settles in. Yeah, tillage collapses aggregate structure and crumb structure and so forth. And so conversations that people have about ideal soil being chocolate cake and having 50% airspace and pore space, it's quite an accomplishment to dig a root pit and put all the soil back into the root pit and have that actually be a depression in the field because it now no longer has enough pore space. And it's quite a pronounced visual. It's You can see this pool. It's now a wet spot, now turned into a wet spot because of the depression in the field from this uh, collapsed soil structure where the root pit was. It's really remarkable. So given that, Lauren, given the remarkable improvements in soil health that you have observed and soil porosity and no longer having compaction with controlled traffic farming, why has it not become more widely adopted? It takes management. It takes forethought and setting things up and full width tillage mask a lot of that. As a good friend of mine said, the more precise we get, the more precise we have to be. Things show up a lot quicker when you're in controlled traffic. I mean, we start picking up on our planters, if a row unit, the down pressure, the closing system, all that is more evident 
as we go. When I was in Australia there two, three years ago, at their field demos, the biggest thing they had was the uh, their tramline mediation program, or however you want to call that, where they're actually backfilling the tram lines and that because they're getting the depressions. And they, they couldn't believe in our wet environment that I've never had the need to fill in our tram lines because we're squeezing it out. The only place I could see that is in our waterways and stuff like that. Just for the simple fact, we're running mostly tractors in the field. That's another step to alleviate compaction. I have, used to have pictures. I still got them somewhere, but uh, our top two, three inches will get like asphalt, but then it, it's just like driving on a road the rest of the season. Now we've got to the point where my goal is we never, even if we're in corn on corn, we'll never shift more than uh, three, four inches. Basically keep on the tram line and we'll zigzag back and forth in that three inch zone. I want to go back to your comment where you talked about the planter and wheels and so forth showing up now more than they have historically. Am I understanding correctly that you're saying that the soil surface and soil system has less forgiveness now than it did earlier? Well, it's probably more forgiving, but it's also you can mess it up easier, I would say. Some of the technology we're running makes that a lot less, you know, a lot less apparent. But uh, usually every year, you know, that's why we're I'm getting so critical on that. I want to get as little shift as possible because that tram line is so evident the row right next you know depending on which way i shift there will be a row that shows up yield wise i don't know if we're losing a lot but you know you have to remember that would be masked by the compaction all the way across the rows broad acre tillage would you'd induce a little tilly you know a little compaction on everything but that's one of the challenges i'm still seeing it almost makes me wonder you know go back to what i've seen in australia they're so far ahead of what we're doing they don't even see their tram lines generally and it's just the tram line and then your rows accommodate that and as my equipment evolved that's kind of where we're getting to now i'm running three different planting rigs just for the simple fact you know 30 inch corn planter set i have a the relay planter that shifts side to side 15 inches so them rows are offset from the corn rows but then the interseed driller you know when we're setting up for the relay that drill runs in between the corn rows, so you're never planting in a stock butt is my goal. That start to help us alleviate some of what I was seeing early in the game. It really shows what the compaction does. You know, with our planter, we've got the down pressure sensors and all that. You know, I can see that. It's just learning how to manage that better. As you started down this pathway of growing, of using controlled traffic, it's my understanding that you were the first farmer in North America, as far as I'm aware, to really start looking at growing corn in wider rows. How did that come about? What's the story of growing corn in rows significantly wider than 30 inches? That's one of those deals. Again, the old boys used to do stuff like this. You know, and I remember in my youth, uh, guys in dryland, Colorado, Kansas, and that, they were looking at the wide rows, never thinking that would be something that would work in Iowa. Over the years, I met a guy named Bob Recker. We tend to challenge each other and through our peer group and stuff like that, uh, we do testing together. We had the opportunity once upon a time to set up a tram line study and to push it to the next level, we went as far as pushing it into a prescription tram line. What the goal was, the planner was going to shut off a row and then push that population to the two rows aside of it. The rest of the planter was running variable rate population. John Deere didn't even think that would work, but we did it. There was about five or 10 farmers involved in that study. And I was the only one using interseed cover crops at that time out of the group. The first thing we noticed was the value of the extra biomass that we saw in the tram lines. The 60 inch gap was just phenomenal cover crop. The two rows on either side was uh, very pronounced better than the rest of the field. Seeing all that, as we're looking through the data and that that fall, you know, that's my mindset was 3060 corn. And, you know, so that's how I plan to set up my plot. During that same time frame, Chris Teachout and myself were heading to Ireland and uh, 
you know, as we landed in Ireland, I've seen all the sheep over there and I'm like, you know, and I'd heard the stories of guys getting semi loads of ewes in from Montana, turning them loose in standing corn when it was knee high, stuff like that. Yeah, as a kind of a weed and feed program, we always joked. But I never actually sat and talked to somebody that done it. And here, Chris Teachout's family used to do that out in Western Iowa. He had kind of firsthand knowledge. And, you know, when we got back to the States, had my after action report with uh, Bob Rucker there and kind of told of what I was planning on doing. He's like, Lauren, there's a problem there. He's like, you're going to waste a third of the soil surface. And I was like, no, no. You know, we had pictures and all that. We were comparing everything. And I was like, look what's happening here. This is this is a no-brainer. And Bob's the kind of guy, I tell everybody, he's, he's the kind of, the best part about Bob Recker is he's the kind of guy that's going to push it right to the limit. The first true 60-inch plot was supposed to be the failure. Fast forward through the season there. We started watching the cover crop. You know, we're out there monitoring, measuring biomass and all that stuff. Bob, I'll give him credit. You know, he took it in his plot. He had what he called the barcode plot that year. And it was just all different, you know, four row with one row skip, four row with two row skip, three rows with one row, you know, just all random. It looked like a barcode from the air. Come fall, you know, we started comparing everything. And sure as heck, Bob was right. You know, that... 3060 corn, the foliage was so much pronounced that uh, the 30 inch gap just did not have the boost in the growth, you know, but the 60 inch gap was just phenomenal. And, you know, my, my ultimate goal was to get the sheep in there, but I have that little caveat through history there that I can't be around livestock. So about three, four year stretch there, I tried to work with neighbors, get sheep in and stuff like that. And, you know, the only takers I could get was 4-H kids. I just decided at one point, it's like, I'm not going to risk a 4-H kids prize lamb to get a photo op. And I've kind of dropped the ball on that the last couple of years. We're still, you know, I still put the 60 inch plot in every year to help Bob. But then this year, our 60 inch plot, I finally realized it might be the piece of the puzzle that I've miss, been missing to help set up for the relay crop better. So my goal is this year we're going to relay our cereal crops into standing 60-inch corn this fall. Through my work with Dawn Equipment Underground Ag, we've actually built a little 60-inch drill that's set up to put the twin rows. Bob's got the little tractor on RTK. We're going to run that down. If the corn's standing good enough, you know, we did have a pretty good wind event here. It's kind of goosenecked a little bit, but I think that's just a minor detail that we can engineer around it. We're going to set up and do the relay crop in standing corn. At the same time, we've got 30-inch corn right next to it. We're going to be running the robot in there, putting our cereal rise, you know, our cereals in at black layer on corn this year. Because for some reason, whatever's going on in the world, we just were to the point we're not getting a fall anymore. That's why we had to drop out of the relay crop game this year. We just we're having a hard time getting our cereals in in the fall timely to get a good enough crop worth harvesting. You know, it makes a great cover crop yet, but in that deal I'm doing tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. You know, we're we've got to be careful. You know, so many of us have got the mindset we're going to do this, but we've also got to recognize the signs when Mother Nature says, "Hey." Time to pull the plug, pull the plug. You know, don't ride the horse right over the cliff. Lauren, what is required? You're talking about growing corn on 60-inch rows instead of 30-inch rows. And you and I have had conversations about what is needed to achieve the same yields and that in many cases, farmers may not be observing the successes with 60-inch corn that you have been observing What are the things that need to be done right? What are the things that you can't screw up? I'm also curious... What yield performance are you observing from 60-inch corn versus 30-inch rows? Every time we have took it to yield, we've actually matched or beat yield in our plots with the 60-inch rows versus the 30-inch rows. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact, you know, we're running an electric drive corn planter. I can set the population, and that's what we actually end up with. A lot of times when I look at the fine details of the plot work, it, a little bit, if we're going for yield, they just don't quite get the plant population where it needs to be. And, you know, to do that, you might have to slow the planter down. Having that planter performance optimized is critical. It's just like any other thing. 
when you start pushing the boundaries, you're going to start highlighting all the little nuances that are going wrong. I mean, when you've got a plant an inch apart in row, every little thing's going to matter. Some of the other things, you know, you got to stop and ask yourself is yield the ultimate goal though, you know, so can you sacrifice 10% of the corn yield to get better grazing opportunity in the fall? You know, if livestock is your main operation, maybe you don't quite need to push that ultimate, you know, yield goal just so you can uh, optimize your cover crop in there and get an extra month of grazing in the fall. How are you varying populations on 60 inch rows compared to 30 inch rows if you're trying to go for ultimate yield? Are you matching the exact same population? Yes. Uh, last year, one of the things Bob wanted me to test on the 60 inch rows was you know, the maximum population. Bob and I had a little miscommunication. He tends to talk in row population where I talk uh, field average. He texted me what he wanted me to plant, you know, and the text clearly came 35,000, 45,000, 55,000, 65, 75, 85,000. So that's what I punched in my monitor as I planted. Well, essentially, we were double of everything he wanted us to be. It was very neat watching the plot last year because early on, the 85,000, or as in Bob speak, would be 170,000 in row. And, you know, that's where we had the plants just less than an inch apart. Them plants started growing faster earlier. You know, they were putting it all to, all their energy was going towards vertical growth. And you kind of had the bell curve. You know, that side of the plot was growing faster. And then finally, as we started hitting the moisture limit, you know, the middle of the plot started excelling. The high population started stalling out. In the end, when it comes to ultimate yield, all the plots were within a bushel and acre. Wow, that's genetic fluidity. I, I, I watch a lot of guys, you know, they, they're like, oh, you need an upright leaf. You need uh, flex ears. You need this and that. When, when you start cramming that population, the plant will naturally express itself different. It's going to be one of those deals, you, you know, I think a lot of guys are trying to run before they walk and focus on the fundamental details to, you know, get that population and that optimized and perfect seed placement and all that wonderful stuff. If you are doing livestock, which you are not able to on your farm, so you haven't actually experienced this yet, but if you are willing to sacrifice a little bit of yield and go with slightly lower populations and then to build a cover crop biomass, what is possible in building a biomass? You mentioned an additional month of grazing, but at, at what population densities? How much additional dry matter can you produce on an acre? Well, I know I know some of the guys that are doing that. It would probably be best to let them speak for themselves. But I know, you know, guys 50, 60 miles south of here doing it. Uh, generally, you might get a month of grazing in the fall here. But uh, I would say they're getting two, three months of grazing, you know, through the winter. Two, three months of extra grazing is a lot less hay they got to feed. And then if you get it overwintered, then you can uh, get the cattle back out there in the spring sooner. And uh, like I said, I probably better defer to some of them guys I forgot a lot of livestock, I guess, stuff, I guess, is what I'm saying. But, and, uh, you know, that that's the one thing over the years I've realized, you know, my focus is on what's happening now. I used to focus on livestock just as intently as I do the row crop side, but anymore it's getting a little age is doing scary things to a guy. <laughs> well, being willing to sacrifice... 15 or 20 bushels per acre on yield or 10 bushels per acre on yields to get an additional two or three months of grazing seems like a very economical trade-off. That's an easy decision to make. Lauren, you've adopted, as, as you've been on this pathway, this evolution, as you call it, to looking at different cultural management practices and controlled traffic farming and growing water corn and some of the different crops and relay cropping that you're looking at. You've developed a different perspective on what is possible with cropping and grain cropping from an agronomic perspective and also from an economics perspective. I enjoy hearing from people who've developed really different perspectives. So one of the questions I'd love to ask you is, what is something that you believe to be true about mainstream agriculture that is very different from the mainstream view that many others might not believe to be true? Uh, probably that kids have a place in ag today. I mean, I was a kid, I was the only kid in my graduating class in the 80s that uh, came back to the farm and been in survival mode ever since. But I'm seeing and hearing 
a lot of the same things right now that we heard back in the 80s. The parents were encouraging the kids to go to college and stuff like that. And I'm a firm believer that uh, self-education can trump uh, formal education. It just, uh, we need, we need uh, them kids out to, to promote them kids that are out there trying to do that. You know, just last night on Facebook, I seen a young guy, a friend of mine out in Pennsylvania, his son, Nate Criswell, at an event, got up and told the family story. You know, their, their farm story. You know, my kids can tell them stories when they get given the opportunities and we need to uh, promote stuff like that. How can we promote that? How can we have our children have a desire to come back to the farm and be more engaged rather than encouraging them to leave? Uh, you know, in our own experience, you know, through some of the stuff we did, we started a 4-H kids program here right on the farm. That hasn't been easy, but we have some beautiful success stories out of it. That's partially why we do a bunch of the field days. You know, this year with everything going on, we had to back off. Yesterday, there was supposed to be a big kid component at the fairgrounds and stuff like that. But just empowering kids with the the want to learn, the desire, and, you know, self-promotion and goes a long ways. You know, when you can, one of the best stories I'll ever remember with the kids deal is, uh, some of the young ladies that we've had involved here work with Jill Clapperton, and Chris Nichols, stuff like that. They've want, they want to become soil scientists now and stuff like that. A city kid that started coming out here, his mom, the one day she's like, I never dreamt my kid would want to go to nag school, stuff like that. You know, that that's, and our own kids, you know, the reflection of what we've done is going to show up in our kids. All three of my kids want to come back to the farm. we got to figure out how to make that happen. You know, that's part of why I'm doing what I'm doing now is getting ready to step out of the way to give them the opportunity. And, you know, that's what I see. A lot of people, a lot of people don't want to step out of the way and give the next generation a chance. And I think I told you quite a bit the last week here that uh, the biggest thing lacking in our operation right now is that young mind. And I, I hope we're inspiring that. A moment ago, you used the word opportunity. Where do you see the opportunity in agriculture, both for the existing farmers that are here now and for this next generation of, of farmers? In some ways, there is a despondency in agriculture and kind of an acceptance of the status quo and a, a lack of looking for inspiration and other additional opportunities. Where do you see opportunities in agriculture in the future? Right now, I would say it was, would be the niche markets. I mean, but one has to be very well aware of the risk in them, them style markets. You know, if a company wants to make a difference right now, figure out how to position themselves to help fill the voids. And uh, currently, many are afraid to do that. You know, the critical learning from my experience is that folks that build an operation will excel in that environment. The people that have the mindset that, you know, they're just going to step in and buy somebody else's dream and tweak it and make it their own tend to fail. A lot of times experience is the best teacher in the school of hard knocks. The only problem with learning from experience is that you get the test first and then the lesson afterward. Something experience will teach you though is you don't just dive in whole hog and uh, you know them calculated risk. I'm sure a lot of the things we've done in the past look like we're diving over the cliff but you kind of get to the point where you can reason things out in your mind and deduce what's going to work, what's not going to work. You know, yes, you're, you're going to take a test right from day one, but uh, them calculated risk is going to be the deciding factor. What most limits farmers from achieving the potential their farms are capable of? We know that with your operation, you're achieving some really remarkable results with soil health, and you're maintaining or even increasing yields because of that soil health and better water infiltration, water storage capacity, and so forth. What do you observe that is limiting farmers, both yourself and others, from achieving their full potential? That would probably be the letter I. <laughs> more people need to learn WE is more capable. You know, I, I, that, that's as I've been around the world, that's the one thing I've listened to a lot. A lot of the most successful people, they, they talk and everything is a, in terms of we did this, we did that. You know, the minute a person starts saying I, it kind of brings it down to the, the focal point. 
none of this would be capable if if it wasn't for the team aspect. You know, I couldn't do what I doing if it wasn't for my dad setting me up to learn. And to me, it was uh, kind of hereditary. You know, he had to fast forward learning, upgrading technology and all that in his career. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been farming. Through my background, you know, well, I told a little story to you the other day of me being the receptionist at the hair salon. You know, you've got to be able to do every position available, but uh, let people express themselves and use their strong suits. You know, a lot, a lot of times everybody thinks when I'm talking about our operation, I've got a herd of people out here, but usually it's me putting the crop in, taking it out. Uh, my wife makes that possible. You know, she takes care of a lot of things so I can do my thing. And in the fall, she jumps in and helps me. My dad, uh, up until about two years ago, he would still show up and do the help with harvest, but uh, it's down to me and her now, and uh, hopefully the son-in-law shows up once in a while. And now I got the son-in-law to candidate. Hopefully we get him fired up, showing up and helping a little bit. But uh, also looking forward to trying to make a place for Rollin to show up and help, as you know, our son Rollin, he's got the passion, and desire to understand a lot of this. Lauren, agriculture has constantly evolved and changed, and there's every year there's new technologies and new ideas developing. And it seems that we're in a moment right now where that is perhaps changing faster than ever. Earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that you're starting to use robots to plant seeds in row in 30-inch corn to plant rye. And I find this interesting because when you look at the way technology has revolutionized our world in general, this has largely been a, if you will, a software evolution, a revolution. But we haven't had affordable robotics that could easily be adapted to agriculture in the last couple of decades. And we're now in the place where that is no longer the case. All of a sudden, robotics are becoming very affordable. And the software is there to essentially do whatever we can imagine it can be created. When I look at the agricultural landscape and how it's changing and evolving very quickly, what I come away with is that farmers also need to change, and perhaps our models of agriculture need to change. And of course, I'm personally very enthusiastic about having regenerative agriculture becoming the mainstream, which is also going to require significant change. The question that I would have for you is, what do you see as the leverage points for changing the way crops are produced to a much healthier state of affairs for the ecosystem and for the environment? If you could change one thing in agriculture, what would that be? Mm. <laughs> if I could change one thing in agriculture, what would that be? Government intervention. Is that going to be a hot button? <laughs> I mean, the current uh, government intervention has skewed us towards where we're at today. You know, I have went to bat over this a few times and I've been chastised a little bit, but zero is a fair number. And anything above that in, invites outside market influences. It's going to be that simple. I've, I've been to other countries. I see what Zero has done. And if you truly want to inspire innovation in that, we've got to give the guys that are willing to step it out there, you know, versus relying on a guaranteed paycheck, the chance to thrive. Part of the reason we have this focus system, you know, streamlined corn beans in Iowa is you can almost guarantee a profit, you know, so that that's just going to speed up consolidation, all that stuff. And, you know, if we put some inherent risk back into the farming, you will see the competitive spirit come back. Yeah. This has been a recurring conversation with colleagues who I visited with from other countries around the world that our crop insurance and crop supports and so forth have effectively stifled innovation because it is easier to just keep doing what we're doing and have that comfort, not assume any risk. And of course, that has also led us to the place where today we're, we're overproducing corn and soybeans. It's, I don't know, when, when I consider that 40% of the United States corn crop goes to ethanol production, there's 
seems to me to be a lot really, really wrong with that picture. Oh, it's so wrong that it almost doesn't need to be explained or shouldn't need to be explained. Lauren, you've adopted different mindsets, different approaches to agriculture. What is something that you wish all farmers knew? Something I wish all farmers knew was the knowledge of how folks made it through the Great Depression. You know, the chance to learn from those that lived that are dwindling. You know, our grandparents, are, you know, our forefathers, they lived in a time when you had to manage everything around you to make a living. You know, now we, we supplement with products and stuff like that. Green manures and simple covers was the way they created fertility in a period that shortly after the Dust Bowl. I think that was significant in the fact that, you know, it was right about the advent of commercial fertilizer occurring about the same time. I've had that conversation with some people, you know, and that that's kind of where my mindset, you know, has been all these years. If we can go back to that point in time and pick and choose the best practices then and combine them, combine them with what we know now, that's a big deal. A lot of forgotten knowledge from that time frame. There is a lot of forgotten knowledge about cultural management practices and how they develop fertility and manage soils. Absolutely. Lauren, you're a fairly directly spoken individual, which I really enjoy. We don't pull punches. <laughs> so this next question um, is either uh, maybe not as appropriate or it strikes really deeply. And the question is, what is a topic that you would like to speak more about, but you often don't because you sense that many farmers may not be ready to hear it or may be uncomfortable with the conversation? The future. Facing consolidation in a commodity production, you know, low-cost producers are going to win. We need to figure out what side of the fence you want to be on. You know, do you want to be a commodity producer in a you know, mature industry? Or do you want to figure out how to maximize nutrient availability and use them keys to compete with the higher input cost that's bound to happen as mine fertility becomes scarce? If we can figure out how to maximize nutrient availability and understand which plants help us release what we have will be critical. Would you say on your farm that you are a low-cost producer? I'm not afraid to say that. I guess I know, you know, it, it's a little weird this year, you know, as everybody came around this past two weeks. I keep telling everybody I'm, I'm so close to conventional farmer this year. It's almost scary. I'm starting to complain a little like a conventional farmer, <laughs> which is totally unlike me. But, uh, you know, I, I, I consider this year a rebuild year and I'm not afraid, you know, people need to, sh I, that's going to be what I want to, I want people to know and see, you know, you might just need to take a reset year, and that, that's what I'm calling this year, a reset year. But I, I've, as I've seen, what I'm seeing right now has been a two-year landslide, and we, we just couldn't get ahead of the curveball. You know, so, hey, bite the bullet. We're going to reset this year through some of the connections and that. That's how we're going to figure out how to rebound from this. And like I said, you know, that brings us right back around to talking about the future, I think. I think the future of agriculture is bright. We just need to figure out our niche and be involved. Thank you, Lauren, very much for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom and insights and experience. Really appreciate having you here. It's been a pleasure having you here and doing this podcast with you. It's been kind of an honor. Thank you, Lauren. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening and we look forward to working with you.